the physical science lesson video for section 5.2 and if you'd like all my videos in one spot just subscribe to my channel and you'll have them for the whole year. Alright, so we talked about Mendeleev's periodic table, the first useful periodic table in the section 1 video. So now let's talk about our modern periodic table. There's a little bit of difference between the two, but they're pretty similar actually. So Mendeleev developed his periodic table before the discovery of protons. So he put his periodic table in order of atomic mass. In the modern periodic table, elements are arranged by increasing atomic number, which is the number of protons. Okay, so the atomic number is the top number. That's why you'll see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, all the way through about 118. Um, so if you look, though, most of the masses are actually in an increasing order also, but there are some discrepancies. Okay, so if you try to answer on a question that the modern periodic table is arranged by atomic mass because it looks like it is, because of those few discrepancies, that's wrong. Okay, so Mendeleev arranged his in increasing atomic mass. Our modern periodic table is arranged by increasing atomic number, which is the number of protons. So each row in the periodic table of elements is called a period. Okay, so each of these is referred to as a period. The number of elements per period varies because the maximum number of electrons increases from energy level to energy level. So what we say is that one row represents an energy level on the atom, like when we're talking about the electron cloud. Okay, so each row represents an energy level. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven rows. These two actually plug in right here. So we have seven rows, seven energy levels. And so that's why it's not just a perfect rectangle. The first energy level we know can only hold two electrons. So the first row only has two elements. The second energy level can hold eight electrons, so if you look, there are eight elements. Now once we get below the second, it starts doing some weird things where you really need to move on to chemistry to kind of understand what's happening there because we only go into Bohr's model in this class. Each column on the periodic table is called a group. And if you learn back in middle school that it's called a family, we do not call those families anymore. So rows are called periods, columns are called groups. The elements within a group have similar properties. So, for example, let's pretend like the property is the color. These colors obviously aren't what the elements actually are. So if you look, every element in this column right here is blue. Every element in this column right here is green. Now, of course, by properties, we don't usually mean color. A lot of times we're talking about, you know, have a high melting point, or are metallic in nature, or, you know, tend to be very reactive, things like that. The elements in the same group or column have similar properties. Now, do elements in the same period or row have similar properties? No. But there is a repetition of properties. So see, we have red, orange, yellow, green, blue, 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 purple. Okay, I didn't realize there's going to be three blues on here. And then again, if we start on the next row, we have red, orange, yellow, green, blue, 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 purple, like that. So you have a repetition of properties every time you start a new row. The pattern of repeating properties, which is what I just showed you with the colors going across, across a period um, when the elements are arranged in order of increasing atomic number is called periodic law. So periodic means it happens like in regular intervals of time. So every time we start at a new row on the periodic table, we're going to see the same properties. So again, pretend like the properties are colors. So if you watch, as we go across, we see the same repetition of colors. Now, of course, are there little variations sometimes between different rows? Yes. But overall, in general, as we move across the, row, the, across the rows or the periods, we see a repetition of properties, not the same properties. In a column, we see the same properties. In a row, we see a repetition of properties, and that repetition is called periodic law. So, we've talked about mass number before. It's the number of protons and neutrons that are in the nucleus of an atom. We discount electrons because their mass is so low. But there is a difference in atomic mass. When you look at a periodic table, the number on the bottom you see is atomic mass. That's why it has decimal points. Like, there's no reason we should have part of a neutron or proton. So mass number will always be a whole number. But atomic mass is the value that depends on the distribution of an element's isotopes in nature and the masses of those isotopes. So think about your grades. Like when you go on the infinite campus and it averages them for you, you'll see something like 84.17. And then you'll see 84. So 84 is like the mass number. It's that whole number. But the 84.17, that is the more accurate value and you have your decimal places on that. Okay, so where do the decimal places come from? Well, it, become, it comes from an average of the isotopes. 
So it depends on two things, the masses of the isotope and what this distribution, we call it the natural abundance. So like if I have a sample of lithium, how much lithium is lithium-7 versus lithium-6? So is it like a 50%, 50%? Is there 80% of one of them and 20% of the other? So that's what we call the natural abundance when we're talking about percentage. So think about it on grades again. Your test grades count more than like your daily grades. Um, they're not weighted the same amount. And so isotopes have that same thing occur. Elements are classified as metals, nonmetals, and metalloids. So how are you going to remember all this? Well, the metals are on the left, but not hydrogen, the middle, the bottom, and underneath the stair-step line. So it's kind of darkened here, but I know it's still kind of hard to see. If you start at the top corner of boron and you draw a stair-step, over and down, over and down, all the way down, that's what splits the metals from the nonmetals. But then you have to remember hydrogen is a nonmetal. Then everything on the right of the stair-step is a nonmetal, and the elements that touch this stair-step are metalloids, except for, of course, aluminum. Now, I know polonium and um, actinium aren't colored here either. Once you get down in the really low elements, a lot of times they just have, you know, especially down here, they become where they're just man-made in a lab for not a long period of time. They become radioactive. So a lot of times you'll see just discrepancies kind of down in this area. But for the most part, every element but aluminum that touches the stair step is a metalloid. Aluminum, of course, is a metal. You already should have known that. So what defines metals, nonmetals? What are their properties like? So the majority of the elements on the periodic table are classified as metals. So if you look back, most of them are red, which is metals. Metals are elements that are good conductors of electric current and heat. So remember, they allow electricity and heat to flow through easily. Most metals are solids at room temperature, except mercury is a liquid metal at room temperature. And most metals are malleable and ductile. So malleable means you can easily hammer them and it will reshape. And ductile means they can be drawn into wires. So in other words, if you hit metals with a hammer or try to like force it to change shape, it will change shape. It's not just going to shatter. So ductile and malleable both deal with not shattering. Transition metals. Metals in groups 3 through 12 are called transition metals. Transition metals are that long, thin area in the middle of the periodic table. Transition metals are elements that form a bridge between elements on the left and right sides of the periodic table. One property of transition metals is their ability to form compounds with distinctive colors. So here are some um, little vials filled with different transition metal compounds, and so you can see there's lots of different colors. Transition metal compounds are used in paints and dyes, um, and so that helps give those bright colors. So nonmetals. Nonmetals are elements that are poor conductors of heat and electric current. I mean, think about metal and nonmetal. The name nonmetal makes it sound like it's not a metal, so whatever properties metals have, nonmetals probably don't. Because nonmetals have low boiling points, many nonmetals are gases at room temperature. And the nonmetals that are solids at room temperature tend to be brittle. So instead of being able to be malleable and ductile and you can reshape them like you can a metal, nonmetals just shatter when you hit them with a hammer or something like that. Nonmetals vary in their chemical and physical properties. So if you look at all the metals on the periodic table, most of them are a silvery solid. Like, you could put two metals in front of me, and I, without being able to test them, I could have no idea what the difference is. Whereas nonmetals, they have just a variety. Like, here we have a yellow solid. Here we have a greenish gas. Here we have a uh, purplish black solid. Here we have a reddish brown liquid, black solid, and diamond. Okay, so they all look very, very different. So nonmetals, there's a lot more variation in the properties. So then what's a metalloid? Well, metalloids are in between metals and nonmetals, so it kind of shares some properties of both. So metalloids are elements with properties that fall between those of metals and nonmetals. So, for example, germanium, it might look shiny like a metal. That's actually one of the properties of metals, too, is it's shiny. But it's a poor conductor like a nonmetal. Or like an element, it may be, you know, malleable like a metal, but yet a poor conductor like a nonmetal. Okay, so it just shares the different properties of each. So, as 
you move across a period from left to right, elements become less metallic and more non-metallic. So remember, the metals are on this side, our metalloids kind of go down the stair step, and non-metals are this way. So we go from metal, 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 kind of a metal, to a non-metal. So as we go across, they become less metallic in nature. So, section assessment. What determines the order of the elements in the modern periodic table? Remember, modern periodic table is based on increasing atomic number. Increasing atomic number. Number two, describe periodic law. Well, periodic law states as you move across the periods or across the rows, there is a repeating pattern of properties. So remember, across a row, it's not similar properties. There is a repeating pattern. So we get a pattern here. We see the same pattern on the next row. We see the same pattern on the next row. Okay, so periodic law says as we move across the periods or the rows, there is a repeating pattern of properties. Number three, what two factors determine atomic mass? Well, remember, atomic mass is based on those isotopes. So it's based on two things, the mass of the isotopes and the natural abundance or the percentage of the isotope. All right, so it's based on the mass of the isotope and the percentage or natural abundance that the isotope occurs. And number four, name three categories that are used to classify elements in the periodic table. We have metals, metalloids, and nonmetals. Metals, metalloids, and nonmetals. I think that's the last slide. I, I let me check real quick. Well, oh no, it was not the last slide. All right, number five. What major change occurs as you move from left to right across the periodic table? Well, as you move from the left, where you have all your metals, and move to the right, where you have all your nonmetals, elements become less metallic. So as you move from left to right, elements become less metallic. Number six, the atomic mass for iodine, which is I, is less than the atomic mass of tellurium, which is Te. But an iodine atom has one more proton than a tellurium atom. Explain how this situation is possible. Remember, atomic mass, or mass number, is not just based on protons, it's also based on neutrons. And we know that elements can have different isotopes with different numbers of neutrons. So how is it possible that even though iodine has an extra proton, that it has less atomic mass? It's because the isotopes of tellurium must have more neutrons. Okay, so the isotopes of tellurium must have more neutrons. And then number seven, explain how you know that no new element with an atomic number of less than 100 will be discovered. Well, if you look at the periodic table, one through 100 is already taken. And we already know that if an element has a certain amount of protons, it has to be that same element. Like, I can't find another atom with five protons and it's not boron. Okay, like if I find something, it has to follow that. So since one through 100 are already filled out on the periodic table, we can't find any other elements with those atomic numbers. All right, I'm assuming this is probably the last slide, but let me check. Okay, that was it. All right, so hopefully now you understand a little bit more about our modern periodic table and the way it's arranged and periodic law and a little bit more about how those isotopes affect the atomic mass.